Today is May 7th, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 89. Today we're talking about everything from surveillance technology ordinances, detecting brain disorders with tech, and measuring how screen use impacts development. Can you recognize our faces in the dark? Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Oh, you know it's going to be a good show when I nail the intro on the first time. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined, as always, by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorff. Can you believe it, ladies and gents? A first round intro. I love it. I think it's great. That's how I know it's going to be a good show, Blake. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, You know, (laughs) we have a lot to talk about, but I want to know what's going on in Blake's world. It's been a week since we talked. Yeah, it has. It's been a week and even a little bit longer than normal, right? Because you were out Friday. But uh, so one something I've been experimenting with, Nick, is playing with different sounds to help me re-energize myself at work. Uh, cause I don't know about you, but I get this pretty bad slump no matter what, like supplements I'm taking or nootropics I'm using. I get just like a giant slump in the end of the day where I'm just super tired and it's hard to stay pro- productive or even efficient in what I'm doing. I feel that all the time. Yeah. So one thing that I've tried using is what's called like binaural beats. Basically what it is, is it's playing different auditory tones in each side of your, or in each ear. Uh, and it's usually masked with like real music or whatever, but it's just trying to stimulate different ki- types of brain waves in your brain. And what I did was twice a day, I, ch- I used one for like taking a nap in my car to try and get a little rejuvenation, which worked really well. Uh, but then I used another one for focusing on work for the last half of the day, which I think was more of a it it was it was okay, but it was I think it was more of a function of a bad badly built application or whatever. Uh, but it's it's weird to me that, you know, hearing specific sounds and how you hear them could potentially trigger different states of mind in your brain. I've never really thought about that that much till like the past couple of weeks. And it's uh, it's been interesting to pull, fool around with. That's cool. I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of success you have with it over the long term. I'm, you can't hear it right now because it's coming through the same feed you are. But I'm actually playing a sample right now for our listeners uh, that kind of um, this one at least sounds very spacey, kind of like uh you know, just kind of hanging out in space. That's kind of the, the sense that I get. And it's paired with the visual here of the moon. So maybe that's why I'm thinking of it. But um, yeah, it's just playing very softly in the background. But yeah, I'm curious as to what kind of uh, success you see with this. Now, you mentioned uh, slight rejuvenation from like taking a nap in your car or something along those lines. Um, have you have you noticed an increase in your productivity when you when you use these apps? Oh. Uh- I noticed today when I came back, like I was a lot more alive than I was when I left. So I knew that was a lot. I was a lot better off there. Uh, I was a little disappointed because I, I also tried using a focus version of it throughout the rest of the day. And there was a lot of like stopping and starting because of ads built into a specific app that I was using. So I couldn't really assess any of the benefits. And I think part of it was frustrating me. So I didn't get the full benefit out of it. But from the rejuvenation piece, I mean, of course, like taking those quick 20 minute naps or whatever during the day have been shown to help with productivity. But this like support these uh, types of beats are supposedly able to drop you into like more relaxed state. So when you come out of it, you're supposed to feel more rested, even though it's only been a very short amount of time. Um, okay. So definitely saw a benefit from one, but not so much from like the ones trying to help me focus. Right. Well, you know, there, there's a couple on YouTube. So maybe, maybe you can do that without ads if you have ad block plus or something along those lines. Um, yeah. I'm curious. Maybe, maybe I'll try it too. Yeah, I have to give it a shot. I want to see what it looks like over the next like two weeks and really kind of make an assessment. But yeah, so that's what I'm doing, you know, in my spare time at the office. But Nick, what are you up to, man? You had an awesome weekend. I did. So I mentioned I well, I don't know if I mentioned on the show. I don't want people running into me when I go to these places. But I went to Disneyland on Friday for May 4th um, because obviously May 4th, I'm a Star Wars fan near and dear to my heart. It's it's kind of a. Star Wars holiday, if you will. I mean, for me, Star Wars is every day, right? But May 4th is something special because people made it special. Um, Because of a clever play on words, may the 4th be with you. Uh, Now, that being said, it is kind of the, like, Valentine's Day, if you will. It's a corporate holiday because 
uh, people just capitalize on this thing, but it, it it's special in its own way. So my partner and I went to Disneyland, and you know they did a bunch of special things for Star Wars Day, which was which was really nice. But I have to talk about sort of the guest experience at these theme parks, and um, I, there was one experience in particular that really stuck with me. Uh, and and I've it's not like I've. I haven't seen this. It's not like I haven't seen this before. If you've been on the Star Tours ride, you know that um, at least there is this part of the ride where um, they identify a rebel spy on the uh, on the ship. And what they do is they make it interactive in the sense that as you're getting ready, they take a picture of a random person in in the um, oh in the in the what is it like called? Like in the queue? Yeah. They, they, well, they take a random picture of per, a person sitting down on the ride, and then they project it up on the screen. And, you know, every time I'm like, I want to be the spy. I want to be the spy, you know, because it's, it's like, you know, a bucket list item for me. And uh, let me say now, I was not the spy, but I don't, oh, think, right. I, I don't think I ever need to do it because um, my partner actually was selected for the spy on this ride. <laughs> On May 4th, and it's an incredibly special holiday for us because it's something that we uh, initially bonded over when we first got together. And, and um, you know, Star Wars has been a common theme throughout our lives. So it was, it, was, it was pretty perfect. And I don't know what kind of forces were acting at Disneyland that day. Uh, the force was with us, if you will. But it, it was just a great guest experience. And I thought, you know, I, I've talked about theme park design before and how... You know, some some theme parks do better jobs of like ushering you through lines and giving you stuff to look at and distracting you to make it not feel like such a long line. I still hold that true that Disneyland is the best at doing that. Uh, and and you know, it, it goes beyond that though. It goes with the guest experience. And and can you imagine like if if uh, a small child was selected for that, that would make their day. I don't know, but but it definitely made my day. So I, I don't know. It's just a fun experience I wanted to share with everyone. Yeah, that interactive element of Disney has always kind of blown my mind because it, 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 <laughs> it kind of pulls at your heartstrings no matter if you're like a little kid or if you're somebody that's our age. It's still like a lot of fun. Absolutely. Now, I have to sort of go on one more piece. So talking about this interactive guest experience, in 2019, they're going to launch this new uh, Galaxy's Edge, and it's a, it's the Star Wars land if you will it's galaxy's edge and uh in this land in this new expansion to the park they are going to provide uh, a ride where you can board the millennium falcon and and uh it's going to be much more interactive it's going to be more like a video game where you get on the falcon and you pilot the falcon with a group of four people and everyone has their own roles kind of like uh mission to mars whatever whatever the one in florida is i'm not sure uh you know what you know which one i'm talking about right where, no, I don't. It makes me feel like I haven't been to Disney World or land in a long time. So anyway, they have this. Everyone plays their own part. And, and no matter what kind of um, things you do in the ride affect your experience throughout the park, it's really ambitious. And cu I'm curious to see how it's going to work. Right. So like if you choose to go after the rebels, uh, the first order might approach you in the park and say, hey, here's a medal for going after those rebels or or something along those lines, you know? So so they're going to be tracking you throughout the park and your choices throughout the park, and it's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure. I, I have no idea how this is going to work, um, but Star Tours has has uh, elements of that, right? Like uh, just just interacting with the audience and, and, and going from there. I, I'm very excited, obviously, about Star Wars Land and Galaxy's Edge, but I, it's something that I want to experience and, you know, just sort of the designing behind all that is kind of, I don't know. It, it's, it's really impressive when you think about how ambitious this is and how much thought and design has to go into these types of interactive experiences. Yeah. Especially when you're kind of integrating such new technology and now you're like, you're doing things like tracking where people are throughout the park to help make decisions on rides. They go on. Like it's, it's taking being, being like what's immersive, like what you were talking about from, walking through a line and being distracted and having like little tidbits within a singular ride that kind of make you feel like you're a part of the whole experience a little more. But now it's, it's taking your entire day and kind of weaving it into one cohesive experience that you have and you can have with friends or you can just do it by yourself. It just sounds like a good time. 
Yeah, for sure. All right, well, why don't we get into talking about Human Factor stuff. Uh, before we do, though, I want to bring up, we got a couple things coming up here. We got UXPA in Boston. That's this Thursday, May 10th. Uh, we have a listener in our Slack channel who uh, made a tent. I'm not sure. Do you know if Brian's going? I don't know. I would hope he is. Cause I would hope a, so. That would be a really good one to go to because I think that's one of the biggest UP, UXPA like uh, groups in the entire United States. We should check in with him. If not, uh, you know, see if you're going. And if you are going, hop in our Slack and let us know. AHFE Internationals in Orlando, Florida. That's July 21 through 25. HFES, we got some exciting announcements about HFES. We're not quite ready to reveal yet, but uh, we got some stuff in the works for HFES this year. That's in Philly uh, from October 1st through the October 5th. Then we have HFES Australia coming to Perth. Uh, looks like one of our... Uh, Patreon subscribers is going to help us out with um, some of the coverage coming out of Perth. So that's exciting, too. Good old Mateo, one of our regulars in Slack. Uh, and that's from November 26th through 28th. So there's a, a wide swath of, of different conferences that are going on. Uh, if you know of any other conferences that are related to human factors or that you kind of uh, are, are planning to attend and want to uh, report back to us in our Slack, we're happy to entertain that idea and and uh, you know we we want to, we have this philosophy here about no human factors practitioner left behind. We want to make sure everybody kind of uh, we use these coverage of these events as kind of like a it's like a mini advertisement for them, but it's more importantly sort of advertising the community of people behind these events, right? And and sort of encouraging. Uh, p potentially some of our younger listeners who may be getting into grad school or or um, even some of our listeners who have been in school for a while but have never gone to one of these conferences, it's kind of like an advertisement. Go to these. You get so much out of them. And, and you know, we've received a lot of feedback about our bonus episodes, and we're glad to hear that those are worthwhile to you. And uh, we're going to keep on doing them. We're going to keep on doing those bonus episodes. Most definitely. Those are the most fun to do because it's like just a backlash of so many cool things coming out of these different conferences. I mean, last week was it last week or was it two weeks ago two weeks ago two weeks ago i can't believe it's been that long with the with the kai conference i mean between all that and then what was happening at the healthcare conference and now what we've got coming up at hfa this year it's it's been a it's been a good 2018 so far dick for podcasts it has been uh yeah we we won't have coverage at all these events but we hope to at least have a little bit so uh please 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 do check back for that coverage but let's go ahead and get into Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of, oh, you guessed it, Human Factors. This could be anything from medical transportation, artificial intelligence, psychology, you know, whatever it is. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So this week, last week, Oakland passed a new ordinance regulating the use of surveillance devices by the city. While it's not the first municipality in the nation to do so, the American Civil Liberties Union and the Electronics, Electronic Frontier Foundation are saying Oakland's ordinance is the strongest one yet. The bill is expected to fully pass, and once it does, Oakland police and other city agencies will have to submit a technology impact re report to Oakland's privacy ad. <laughs> advisory commission if they plan to implement new surveillance technologies. Not only does this ordinance require community approval for new tech, but it effectively bars police from implementing surveillance technology without first inform informing its own citizens. Moves like this come as law enforcement agencies across the country are working with vendors to enhance policing capabilities with tech from license plate databases that track the movements of millions of of millions to the AI enabled body cameras that can archive and instantly search through countless hours of footage to identify people. Nick, this I'm really glad you pulled this story because I, I feel like we all we always have a good time talking about this this kind of ethical and dichotomy that goes on here because it's it's at, on one hand of the spectrum awesome for a lot of reasons that technology is at the point where it is that can really benefit police in such a really Benef in a really beneficial way. That's a horrible way to phrase that. But like making the job a little bit easier, potentially a little bit safer, maybe even allowing them to dig a little bit deeper, do some more analysis. But at the same time, it because of different vendor like relationships or what some of this technology can do, it puts a, it puts not the citizen necessarily in danger, but you're definitely risking your information being cataloged at all times when you're out and about in the city so it's it's kind of a double-edged sword i mean do you, do you feel that way about it or do you are you on one side or the other you know i tend to uh, look it's great that we are 
sort of advancing our technology to the point where we can augment these uh, processes and procedures with technology, right? And, and have, it, have it be more efficient overall. Now, I will say this ties in really nicely. I know we keep coming back to this plenary session from last year, but honestly, it really fits nicely, you know, because they talked about applying human factors engineering to policing last year at HFES's uh, plenary session. And it was it was really sort of enlightening that we're we're we have to not focus on the technology that's augmenting. It's like a bolt on piece to this process. Rather, let's fix the process. And this is doing exactly that. Right. It all ties together. in the fact that Oakland now is is requiring sort of this technology impact report where you have to sort of um, think about all the different impacts and we talked about this offline you me and woodrow actually had this conversation in our office about like how how does uh sort of these technologies and these these um capabilities impact not only positively but negatively or or potentially harmfully uh specific populations or um you know just in general the general public how does it impact them either positively or negatively and the that's not really something that we tend to think about we oh here's this new technology this is really cool how can we use this and not always do we sort of think about the impacts all the way through and this is just one more way that we are introducing a process in which the the community has a say over what technologies can the policing system use so i don't know i i really dig this it gives it gives the community a lot more control over um you know, what kind of things are used in their area. Yeah, it's kind of like a really high level way to look at, you know, implementing human factors processes that can at the end, like help the end user. And what I mean by that is Oakland as a city recognizes that where it, where it's located in like the northern part of California, where a lot of this AI technology is being built and taking over. And obviously you're seeing a lot, a lot of places across the country get, this embedded kind of technology being pitched to police departments and stuff like that. And they're taking the time to think about like, okay, what is the real impact this is going to have on our own citizens? And like you said, they're trying to put some, some real process in here. So it has to actually be reviewed. And it, it's not just like, Oh, we have a vendor that come, comes out to talk to the police and makes them think it's exactly what they need, where you could run into security issues. Like if like, for instance, we, mentioned in the blurb like being able to archive and instantly search through just countless hours of footage well think about if that footage got leaked somewhere or if somebody was able to you know monitor a specific person's movements and they weren't like of any kind of criminal invest under any kind of like criminal investigation but what if it gave an insight into when somebody could break into your house or something like that in the wrong hands and i think it's a great great thing to see that a city is taking such a very conservative plan towards okay this technology is great we love our police, but our citizens do come first. And how do we put processes in place that allow all of it to work together kind of in a more cohesive fashion? Yeah, uh, I, it's all good news all around. Uh, I'm really excited to see how... The, the, now, this has been done in other cities, but this is sort of... Um, oh, I forget who's calling it the most conservative or the most uh, restrictive sort of... Um, uh, it, it, oh, yeah, it's the ACLU and the EFF are saying that this is the strongest ordinance yet that that gives basically the most control to the uh, to the citizens of the city. Yeah, and I, I really this is kind of a little off topic, but I wonder what kind of fueled that decision making. Right. Like what about what what had gone on either in different states or if they were hearing different things down the pipeline across what's going on in California or what really made them go with the stricter version of this kind of policy, which at the end of the day, it also makes me question like what's going on in other states. And I'd love to like read and learn about it because just. I mean, what we're really getting here is a technology impact report. And what does that look like for other states? Is it just like they have to just send in that we are using this versus not saying anything at all? Uh, so it's it's be interesting to kind of dive into what those different policies actually end up looking like. Yeah. You know, I think some of the climate around this is there was uh, it looks like in 2016, there was a Bloomberg report uh, about a secret police drone surveillance program in Boston uh, that that the public didn't even know about. And then also there was in new Orleans, a uh, new Orleans, 
there was a use of predicting predictive policing um, that wasn't exposed until a Verge report. So so there's been sort of these in the dark policing strategies, and I don't know what the specific climate of Oakland was to where the the people pushed for this, but um, obviously there have been examples in other areas that maybe they're just taking a preemptive strike against this to to kind of say, look, like let's let's get ahead of this to the left of this, so that way this doesn't happen to us. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because if there's those kind of specific instances. I mean, the call for these kind of like advisory boards and whatnot really it it just makes intuitive sense that somebody like Oakland would go ahead and say like, okay, we've got a lot of tech that's coming from this specific area or around our region of the world. Let's, let's see how it gets implemented in different places and make changes based off of that. So it's cool stuff, man. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's get into this next one. Oh man, this is probably my favorite story of the week. I think this is just like an interesting set of medical stuff. So medical professionals tasked with caring for our minds don't have a really easy job. So to diagnose people with neuropsychiatric diseases, doctors can perform brain scans, but such scans are expensive and the results are sometimes very mysterious. While other options include conducting time consuming cognitive tests or relying on a doctor's own subject subjective analyses from prior experience. Seeing an opportunity, a number of startups have devised quantitative methods to diagnose dise- diseases or assess mental health while patients complete routine activities like talking on the phone, typing on a keyboard, or scrolling through a website. Three companies specifically, MindStrong Health, Neurometrics, and Win- Winter Light Labs, say that they can lift the fingerprints of mental disorders from people's mundane behaviors. Now, Nick, this is a, a pretty serious claim to make based off of just some very what seems like some very simple behaviors a lot of them having to do with interacting with a smartphone but i think it's a really cool application of you know that just behavioral analysis based on things we do from day to day and what it might have to say about what's going on with you cognitively yeah i agree so this one was really interesting to kind of dig through because it it is it is sort of that passive assessment which is like the pipe dream right if we can passively assess whether or not we're doing okay either mentally or physically uh i mean we've seen we've seen this type of thing before with fitbit right fitbit will uh or or we've seen these algorithms at least that will notify us if we're uh, if this algorithm has detected whether or not you were at risk for something, right? Heart disease. Uh, I believe the Apple watch does that. Uh, so, so we've seen this before with physical fitness, but the fact that now we are looking at behavioral data and using artificial intelligence to kind of, um, compare that to other sort of profiles that also resulted in a, uh, in, in a degradation of mental health, that is really exciting to me because if we can passively do this, it's less invasive um, and it's going to be it's it's just going to be better news all around, I think. Yeah, I think so, too, Nick. But I'm I want you to check me on something here. And this is like one scientist it. to another right now. So I'll, let's go through MindStrong Health real quick. Sure. So the, the, the basic premise here is they're using smartphone sensors and usage logs, specifically looking at the rhythms of somebody typing and scrolling on their smartphone. And they're gathering them from people's everyday activity, right? So they're thinking that these interactions measured down to the millisecond of response time can be predictive of, per- of a person's cognitive and emotional state. So their MindStrong is actually already being implemented to use this tech and this like analysis that they're doing in pharmaceutical company drug trials for targeting schizophrenia and depression. The question I have, Nick, is I I understand that like there might be some some strong correlation between your activity on your phone and what kind of mental mental maybe properties or disorders you may or might may not be showing symptoms to but i i'm very i don't know very hesitant about this idea for some reason and i (laughs) I understand like what they're doing here i mean ultimately they're taking the baseline data and then if there's some if they do have some kind of disorder like schizophrenia or depression giving them medication and seeing how the response times change in their kind of daily phone activities. But couldn't that be varied based on the day of the week or based on the things you're doing throughout the day? I mean, I know you might, based off of what I read in their article, you might say that today I was really depressed because I didn't type very much on my phone or I was very slow. But I didn't, I didn't access my phone half the day because I was at work. 
get off my lawn. That's what you sound like right now, Blake. I, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Only because you sound very resistant to this technology. And I don't know. I, look, this is something that we disagree on. And I love it when we disagree on something because it, it creates this conversation. So what what I see this as is, yes, you're right, where you know it, it could vary based on the day or, God forbid, somebody is texting while driving and maybe their text input is a little slower because they're paying attention to the road hopefully, you know, rather than texting or something, you know, you know what I mean, right? So there are these situational things around it. But I feel that the more data they have, the more accurately they're going to be able to sort of measure these things. And I don't think they would go out on a limb and say, you know, with 99% confidence, here's, you are uh, probably going to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or depression or whatever, you know, I think they, uh, I, or at least a good algorithm would take into account those types of things. You know, how fast are you going with location data? Um, you know, and maybe maybe trending stuff, right? So maybe you're depressed today, uh, maybe you had a bad day, but maybe you're not depressed tomorrow or the day after or the day after that. But if it's like continuously or if it's a pattern, a cyclical pattern, depression and mania, you know, and analyzing sort of the, the word choices that you use and it can pick up on those types of things. I think that is also really valuable, too, because it also uh, sort of picks up on these trends that maybe you can't pick up on. Maybe you don't know that you're going from depression to mania. Maybe it's not so easy for you to see that from the inside looking out. But an algorithm that has been trained to look at for these things could. I don't know. It's a very exciting thing to me. And I, I agree with you in the sense that we have to be careful about how we diagnose people using this technology. Cause I don't think, I think it's in addition to, right. I don't think it's the end all be all not going to diagnose them on the spot and say, go see a shrink. Like you got schizophrenia, schizophrenia. It's going to be, you know, I'm going to therapy because I, I feel that there's something that's not quite right. And, um, you know, maybe 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 the therapist goes and and applies these uh, algorithms or or sets them up with the app or whatever it is that you know provides this information. I that's kind of where I'm sitting at with all this. Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not against the technology being integrated in something like mental you health. I think it's out. a giant plus on this side of the fence, right? I mean, especially because when we're talking about if you're implementing some kind of intervention, being at a drug trial or I'm going to like use the fitness example. If you're like implementing a different diet, getting a blood test only once versus getting a bunch of them is not going to give you as much of a clearer picture of what's happening in your body metabolically. Similar to what's happening to your body or how you feel if you can't really assess it all the time. And this may be a really great way because there, there obviously is some strong correlation between people, how people interact with their phone and their current cognitive and emotional states. I don't think there's a problem with that. I just think it's something to draw attention to. And I also, I think I kind of misunderstood maybe MindStrong's uh, thesis is the best way I'll put it because it looks like this is really trying to target how drug intervention is impacting people that with schizophrenia and depression, or at least that's the way it's being used right now. Ah, yes. I, I did see that too. And there's that. Yeah. <laughs> and there's that. <laughs> and there's that. Yeah. I, I right. think... See I think it works a lot better as an evaluation tool, right? Because then you get the before and after. Yeah, and then you you could potentially be getting it all the time, right? Because people are always on their phone. It's one of our like become one of our constants as humans. It seems. Yeah, I don't know. So okay, like I I feel like I don't use my phone in the same way that a lot of people do. Like I I play games on my phone, and I'm bad at texting, and I'm bad at I'm bad at. Uh, Texting, I'm bad at getting phone calls. I'm bad at just using it unless I'm playing a game. You know, like, it's just, <laughs> it's that's weird. Hilarious. Right? Like, I just, that's, I mean, it's there if I need it or, like, if I'm browsing the internet or looking for news stories for the show. Like, that's that's all there. I can do that fine. But actually using it as a phone and a communication device, I suck at. Like, it's just terrible. Man, I think, honestly, it's since the, really the, more people getting in our Slack and asking questions and then you and I using Slack to talk back and forth and various other organizations I work for doing the same. And then me really like getting into some of the social media things, helping other people develop content strategies. I haven't really started using my phone until like the last two or three years in any kind of serious capacity. Like if you ask any of my friends, if you ask Elise, uh, my mom, 
He's like he never picks up his phone. He never sends text back. He's just he's relatively just a pain when it comes to the cell phone. Uh, but I, I don't know, man. I, I definitely see what a lot of people talk about, like a lot of comedians talk about it. And you see in the news that like people are always on their phones. It's almost impossible to have a human interaction without like a phone being involved at this point. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely see where they're pulling this data from or like the kind of population that they're talking about. Yeah. Quick sidebar. Uh, someone on Reddit the other day was like, you know, today's or, or the Today's yawn is the equivalent of of taking out your phone and everybody else takes out your phone. You know how like yawning is contagious? Taking out your phone is now contagious too. If I take out my phone, you take out your phone too. Um, anyway, do, do we want to get into these other two? So neural metrics? Yeah, here, I'll drop in real quick. So these were focused on mainly typing cadence. So before we were talking about just like general interactions with the phone. This is like literally how long people are holding down each key, how long it takes them to move their fingers from one to another. And that way doctors can keep keep an eye out for like major changes or significant changes that may indicate some kind of trouble. So overall, the idea being that if you're healthy, you should be incredibly consistent overall, overall at the times during the day and during, during the week, you should have like kind of a consistent cadence with your typing. But because this habit is actually haywired into your brain, uh, when it, when you get a tax, when your brain like has some problem with maybe a disorder or disease, you should start to see some of that wiring break down, right? So you're going to see a difference in cadence and it's not going to just be a simple one is what they're trying to get at is it would be something very drastic. But the, the interesting part here to, for this story or this particular company, Neurometrics, is that they're not just like looking at depression and schizophrenia, which are specific mental disorders that affect a lot of people, but also some of these bigger diseases that have a lot of like backing behind them in terms of research, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Yeah. This one was really interesting to me. And, and this is kind of where my comment with the driving texting while driving came in, right? Cause your cadence is definitely different while you're driving. And what, what do you do for people who use the swiping technology? Cause I mean, I, I wonder if it's different for that, right? I imagine it's the same thing where, you know, your, your swiping degradate degradation um, breaks down when, when you sort of get diagnosed with one of these things, right? So, like, I'm trying to swipe into our Slack right now. Hi, everyone. I'm swiping. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, well, can't, the, I can't swipe. The, the one part, too, I mean, you could even, like, extrapolate this to people getting sick over time, right? Like, I, I don't, I know that your doctor doesn't really, like, monitor your health or monitor your, like, texting speed all at all times. What if they could get that kind of information fed to them that you're particularly Potentially, you're just getting sick because you're just like obviously having a harder time typing. You don't feel as well. You're not really like keeping up the same cadence that you have. And they could check in on you based on that. Like, hey, how are you feeling? Whether it's like something disorder wise or if it's just like a common cold. Right. It's just one more piece of data, um, you know, and, and now we're seeing partnerships with I, I didn't put this in the news stories. This is a couple weeks old, but um, I think this broke while we were doing high coverage. But uh, now now Google's partnering with Fitbit and uh, to send data to doctors. So data going to your doctor, primary health healthcare physician is, uh, is becoming more and more, um, commonplace. And especially with some of these big tech companies partnering up and it just makes sense for sort of that same type of information from the mental health perspective should be shared among, uh, your devices or whatever you're using and your doctor. I think, I think that's the logical next step. Yeah, so here's where I, where I will be combative against that. And this is only related to not not necessarily, I'm not trying to point fingers at Facebook, but more of the, the bigger overarching thing of the cybersecurity problem, right? Like is when we're talking about mental health, and even if it's between your doctor and it's supposed to be, you know, you're under that PHI clause and it's not supposed to be released anywhere, well, what if it does? Because that can impact a lot of different things. That can impact jobs that you're up for. That can impact, you know, family members who maybe didn't even know that you had depression or whatever you're dealing with so i feel like there's i would i would personally want to see some serious like work on some of the cybersecurity and security aspects of that kind of data information sharing um before it gets really implemented too far because uh, I, I feel like that's a super private matter between you and a physician but once it once it kind of hits some of the systems that we use and anything that's connected to the internet you put yourself in kind of a vulnerable position yeah yeah it's uh yeah, I, I agree with you. I think... What is my deal today? I'm Dr. Doom and Gloom when it comes to the internet. Yeah, yeah, you really are. I mean, you, <laughs> you have a very pessimistic outlook, but at the same time, I think they're very real concerns, right? I think 
if we don't think about these things, then it's it, you're right. It's that it's that impact assessment that we need to start looking at, right? How will this impact? Um, how how will collecting this data impact things like cybersecurity, uh, healthcare, and just in general? So you know, if we can really put our minds to that, we as human factors practitioners put our minds to these types of issues uh, that may arise from implementing this type of technology, then I think. Uh, you know, we'll be in a better place if we have these these impact reports. Yeah, and just for anybody listening, like, don't get me wrong. I think this all of this is a great idea because, right, it could give you your doctor more insight into you as a human being at the current time and moment. So, I mean, that's always a plus. I just like to always kind of think about, like we talked about the, our conversation with Woodrow, like, okay, what are the full impacts of this positive, negative, middle, middle future, whatever? So I think it's just important to think about. But this next one, from Winterlight Labs is probably one of the most interesting to me in this whole set because it's a it's a speech and speech analysis tool. Ooh. So basically, yeah, basically the idea is it's taking a sample of your speech and really monitoring and diagnosing what's going on in terms of Alzheimer's. And they're also saying they might be able to extrapolate it to schizophrenia as well um, and even depression, which I think is even more more of an interesting topic, too. Um but it's it's crazy that this uh, in combination with using a voice sample and running it through an algorithm, they've taken what's typically considered to be running about like 400 variables when you're analyzing speech to narrowing it down to like less than to almost 10 percent of that. So 30 to 40 variables that are actually able to hone in on, OK, these are kind of the key red flag areas we have to look for when it comes to Alzheimer's based off of a person's speech. That just blows my mind. Yeah, I'm so looking at this holistically, right? These are three different companies looking at three different types of data uh, where MindStrong is looking at sort of these response times. Um, Neuro, Neurometrics is looking at the uh, input sort of uh, for, for texting, right? Text input. And then Winterlight Labs is looking at the, uh, the, the verbal. And so putting all these together can really build a strong profile of what kind of things you've got going on and um you know the aggregation of data we've talked about before on the show is is dangerous right you can build a profile of somebody and if that data like like there you go there's your doom and gloom blake if that if that aggregate data gets out then you know it could spell bad news for whoever's d data that is um but yeah i i think this is all really super cool that that we're looking at these different aspects and and uh, the next the next piece will be synthesizing all this and bringing it together into one sort of um, one sort of assessment tool that kind of interplays with each other and, and feeds each other and uh, we're we're on a good track. Well, just some some kind of small silly thing to think about is like I remember back in like two thousand. 2007 ish i still had a phone that had only the keys on it for the regular number like a house phone and the only way you could text is by hitting each key a bunch of times to try and figure out how to spell words and now we're talking about using smartphone data to basically predict our behavior but not just our behavior how that could be impacting our mental health as a as a whole across a lot of different people ironing out different things like how to how do we predict you know early set on Alzheimer's or schizophrenia or depression and what we can do about it is like early interventions. And that just blows my mind in less than, I don't know, probably less than 10 years. I'm sure these startups have been around longer than just 2018. Uh, so this is, I don't know, it's a kind of incredible time to be, be a human factors practitioner, but just be a human in general and just all the technology we have. It's a great time to be a human. <laughs> all right. Well, before we move on to our next stories, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Gizmodo, the IEEE Spectrum, Science Daily, and Defense One for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media channels or join our Slack for links to the original articles. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? Oh, we've got another story to help feed Blake's doom and gloom is what we yeah. have. All right. Let's so. hear it. <laughs> So this is a new study that examines the effectiveness of the Q or sorry, the screen Q, a measure of screen based media use in children. So the explosion of screen based media has transformed the experience of childhood from TV and videos to an unlimited range of content available at any time via portable devices that can be challenging to monitor for sure. And the emergence of these technologies has far outpaced our ability to quantify its effects on childhood development, human relationships, learning and health, and fueling controversies among parents, educators, clinical providers, the whole gamut. 
But the skew cream is a <laughs> the, the skew cream. <laughs> Okay. The screen cue is a novel measure of screen-based media use in children intended for pe- pediatric clinical use, incorporating evidence-based factors known to influence effects, including the access to screens, the frequency and context of their use, uh, the content that's actually being watched, and then the co-viewing with a grown-up caregiver. So, Nick, I, I feel like this is a super important thing to be talking about and really understanding from... From our standpoint, and I'm, I'm surprised we haven't really seen a lot more of these stories since we started Human Factors Cast because the impact of screens being much more prevalent from being in the classroom to being in just like a child's life in general have like grown astronomically. Like I feel like I'm I feel like I sound like my dad when he was saying, well, you grew up with a computer. Well, like some kids are growing up with YouTube. Right. Yeah, I know. It's it's really strange to think about how much our digital world has changed over the last even 10 years, right? Um, And the fact that, you know, we have this sort of epidemic of, (laughs) of, you know, children playing Fortnite in schools or, you know, just interacting with screens that could enhance their education or detract from it, right? And, And sort of also, what is the sweet zone for how much screen time is appropriate? And this study kind of gets at that, right? Yeah, it really goes more into the benefits of this specific measure. So the screen cue, not any of those other versions that I tried to mention. Um, really trying to get at that this is probably the most robust measure to really understand what's going on in terms of a, a, a child's kind of impact when it comes to like how, how often they're using or how often they're viewing content on screens and stuff like that. And then what, what really is the impact if they're just watching it by themselves versus, you know, with a parent. Right. So, I mean, this is a good sort of way to measure this stuff. If you're studying sort of the developmental psychology in human factors, it's a great way to kind of uh, investigate this type of thing. And and, uh, I'd be curious to see, you know, going forward, how many other studies use this tool and and what kind of, um, you know, validation is going to be discovered for for this tool. And if it truly is uh, the, the new standard. Yeah, and I think uh, it it seems like based off the article, some of the pediatric associations in America are definitely taking some of the preliminary preliminary evidence from the screen queue to really say that it's sufficient and valid enough to be used to help decide on okay, if we're seeing some behavioral problems from stu- from not students necessarily, but children in general, like what can we really do? Are there cognitive behavioral risks coming out from this? What can we really do to change that behavior and uh, you know, increase their development more so and kind of get away from any of the degrading benefits. Uh, but I, w- I would, I'd love to know kind of how you can really tackle that with some of these younger kids, because I know from experiences I've had a lot of people's children, they're actually using, you know, tablet devices in classroom. They have to take it home, do their homework on them. Like there's, there's not a whole lot of options of escaping all like having to use screen media at all times. Um, and there, there's probably the argument and I, I would even make it that there's some benefits to definitely having that kind of interaction. Like I know there's a lot of students that are as early as fifth grade, like learn how to code at a basic level. But I mean, that was something I would have never dreamed of at that age. And this, this kind of, that's only through interacting with screens and being able to like get access to different, different types of information, uh, whether it be like nefarious or educational. Yeah. I, yeah, I, you brought up a good point where, you know, the coding, I, I have a family member who's what, like, eight or nine years old and they're going to a coding camp this summer. And I'm like, wow, I wish I had that. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. So there's just like, there, there's definitely still this dichotomy between like, it, it's, it's great to have them, but like the, the, the amount that people are consuming, I mean, I think even at an adult level too, it's, it, it is kind of overwhelming and it's, it's like they said, like technology has been advancing so fast and been, content at the same time is always available like how do we even assess what this what impact this is possibly having on us i agree yeah do we want to get into these key findings or yeah we can talk something about the key findings okay so break it down real quick so they suggest a kind of goldilocks effect so here where audio may be too cold at at a specific age requiring some more cognitive strain to process an actual story animation is actually a little bit too hot so fast-moving media that renders 
rendering the imagination and network integration less necessary. So you're kind of very much passive watching this stuff, like just a lot of crazy animation, a lot of colors. You're not really taking in the story. And illustration seems to be kind of just right. So not somewhere in between like a lot of fast animation and this kind of like illustrated version is, is something children are able to you know, process a little bit more. And I think a lot of this re- relates to using the screen cue in conjunction with an MRI study that they don't dive as deep into in this specific Science Daily article. Uh, but they u- they definitely use the screen cue as one of their kind of uh, categorical measures. Yeah, and I can definitely see these changing over time, right? As the child becomes older, uh, maybe, you know, too hot, uh, fast-moving media may become more appropriate for them as they enter their teenage years. Um, and to kind of break this down through developmental cycle, I think would be an interesting next step for this type of, uh, methodology. Yeah. And even taking these like concepts that they have defined and saying like, okay, this is the type of media that would be useful in the classroom for us to develop versus like yeah. different, different styles. So there's a lot of utility and, uh, application to this kind of measure. Yeah, I agree. All right. Why don't we get into our last story of the week? All right, here we go. So the process of computational facial recognition involves precisely measuring a photograph. So this includes eye size, distance from the nose to the mouth, among other features, and adjusting the distances for three dimensions, then searching a database for a specific match. But it becomes increasingly difficult to do that at night when all you have is far lower resolution thermal images. Well, believe it or not, to solve this, the Army Research Lab used a technique that allows software to mimic the human brain. Thermal images show what parts of the face are hotter and cooler, but generally contain fewer data points than a comparable optical image from a camera, making it hard to pick out any kind of real distinct features. So the ARL set up a convolutional neural network, or a CNN, which is a deep learning method that uses specific nodes similar to the brains and set it to infer faces from very limited data. The researchers were able to produce highly discriminative representations despite the fact that the synthesized imagery did not produce a photorealistic texture. The verification performance achieved was better than both baseline and recent approaches when matching the synthesized faces with the actual visible face. So that was an entire mouthful, but isn't that kind of nuts that you're able to even think about doing facial recognition in from a thermal image in the dark? Right, and, and and it kind of opens up the the gateway for other non-visible spectrum, right? RF, microwave. Can you do these uh, facial recognition with other types of sensors rather than just the visual spectrum in which we know? Um, and so this article actually comes to us from Defense One, and uh, one of our listeners in our Slack actually posted this. It was Dan Sullivan. So thank you for the article, Dan. And he brings up a good point, right? Um, he's excited about the applications for facial recognition beyond sort of uh, the conventional visible imagery, but he's also sort of cautious about this, right? Because what if there's a case where there's some sort of human validation that needs to happen. Um, And what, what happens when that human has to validate based on these, uh, these non visible spectrums, right? So like if, if you are receiving an image in infrared, how can you validate that the system in fact has done a database match and has correctly identified this individual? It it does. It's pretty <laughs> intense to even think about like how this is how this is possible from something that is getting so few data points, but based off of basically just deep learning processing of the information, it's able to create, I guess, create just a synthesized image. But Nick, the part that I'm really, it's not that I'm struggling with it; it's just that I'm blown away with it. Is that there's not a lot of photorealistic characteristics that are coming from these thermal images, yet it's It's performing above baseline to match like a synthesized face with a visible face. Yeah, but Dan's whole point here is about accuracy thresholds and and sort of false reporting. Like how can we validate this type of thing when we don't have an easy method of confirmation, right, from from the visual perspective? Us as operators, how, how can we validate that the system has in fact matched correctly when we can't identify using this thermal spectrum? Oh, you're okay. speechless. So I see what you're saying. <laughs> you're <That's>, speechless. 
That, I mean, how would you even do that? Because that's something we just don't process things in in a normal way. I mean, the only way we're even able to tackle dealing with this kind of issue is by augmenting our vision, right? Like using night vision or thermal scans. Um, yeah, so I, I, I liken this to other types of technology that sort of pick up on these things, right? We mentioned algorithms earlier, right, with health and mental health. And if these algorithms can pick up on stuff that we're not necessarily cognizant of, maybe we can learn to trust the facial recognition if it is providing a higher level of accuracy than perhaps um, the the visual spectrum, the visible spectrum is, right? Maybe we can perhaps learn to accept the system is a little bit more accurate than a human can be, and we just remove the human from it, and then the automation takes over. Uh, but then you know, there's still got to be some sort of check. And I, I just don't know how we tackle that problem. It's, it's, it's a really intense problem that Dan is, is, is bringing up here because uh, especially this was brought up by Defense One. Um, so we're looking at military applications of this and without getting into specifics, that could spell uh, really bad news for someone who validates incorrectly uh, it could it could potentially lead to some intense political conflicts if somebody fails to validate correctly. Uh, there's a lot of really dire consequences if a human cannot validate something that a machine has done in something that they can't understand. It's deep. Yeah. It's deep. <laughs> yeah, I I'm struggling to to use an example. Yes. against that point how this may be more fine-grained than what we're currently implementing when it comes to like a military aspect but i don't i don't really know the the problem is is that that exists right i mean you're at some point you have to put somebody in in place like human operator back in the loop having to understand that there's so much op so much automation going on that they just have to make a call as best they can based off the information they have. And that goes into training, understanding the algorithm, that kind of stuff. And the, I mean, at the end of the day, people do make mistakes and we know that. So do we just get to the point where we trust automation enough and we pull humans out and we don't, that way it's, it's, it's all on the automation or do we always have to have somebody checking it. And in the case of probably military operations or anything that really involves a lot of different people's safety, we're always going to have to have humans making a lot of the calls. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to get around this. I, the only thing I can really say is, I mean, this stuff augments our ability to make decisions, but Dan, is it Dan? Dan. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this is an incredible and thoughtful point that you're pulling out. And I, I really wish I had like more of a cohesive answer to it, but I, honestly, I think the only way or, that this what we the only thing this does is it augments our decision making that we are already having a hard time making decisions in like in in thermal vision are you identifying somebody if you make a wrong call or a right call this is ultimately augmenting it so based off of what they're saying that you're likely going to improve performance regardless of that you can't necessarily see in this visual spectrum spectrum yeah i yeah it's that's some pretty deep talk, but I think we we got to get into Reddit. What do you say? Let's do it. It came from. It came from. That's right. It came from Reddit. This is all the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that the community is talking about. So any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the topic of human factors and encourages discussion amongst you guys, the community, the people who are talking about human factors. Blake, we got time for one tonight. I can't believe we talked so much about some of the other stories, but it was really thoughtful discussion. I really had a good time. But why don't we take uh, one, two or three for tonight's uh, it came from Reddit. What are you thinking? Oh, man, this is tough. This is tough. I know. Uh, uh, I don't know, Nick. Do you have a preference? I'll say I vote for two. All right. You vote for... All right, let's go with two. All right, you say okay. two. Let's go with two. All right, so this is titled Research Focused from the User Experience subreddit. Uh, this comes to us by GJ. Uh, hi, everybody. I am looking to get into UX research. I have an academic background in public health and GIS with two undergraduate research studies published. I really, really like research. Just designing a study and determining the methodology gets me going. 
LOL. Does any <laughs> does anyone know of graduate programs that are strongly research fo focused? Well, I got a few ideas. Uh, a lot of the programs are either focused on design, computer science, or engineering. Flexibility is a plus. Uh, online evening classes, etc. Because I will still be working. From what I've grasped, building a good portfolio is more important than an education for getting a job. What the hell? <laughs> but I. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like the extra practice with peers, mentorship from professors, and a deep understanding of theory. Also, if you have any suggestions of an, on entry-level job titles I should be looking out for, please let me know. Uh, I know this should be in UX Research subreddit, but uh, it's pretty dead over there. So, okay, Blake, what the hell? What the hell? There's, there's a lot to unpack here. I got a lot of answers and a lot of questions. I, I Yeah. All right. Let's go for it. Okay, here, here we go. So you really want to do research, and I'm uh, the acrobat. Okay, yeah. So you really want to do research. That's awesome. If you like designing studies, then you. It sounds like you already have a lot of the skill set. So I mean, it may be just as much as trying to get something that's more you know user research focused, or spinning the two studies that you have to try and create them into the portfolio pieces that you seem to think are much more important than education. Uh, more on that in a second. Um, but they do mention asking for programs that are really research focused. Um, a lot of people that I know, especially a couple of years after me, graduated from the same human factors research program that I was in for psychology at Cal State University, Long Beach. I don't know why I struggled with that for a second. Um, so I would really recommend that uh, it is not online. Um, but one program that I have heard about that is online is actually from Kent State. Uh, and they have a great UX program and some some more like also information architecture programs focused and they're also masters and they're online. Uh, one comment that I'm going to have, and I don't necessarily have the exact experience for this, but if you're really looking to like get, get a lot of practice with peers, mentors from professors, mentors from professors being the key here and really getting much more immersive understanding of theory, you, you might want to intend something in person because there's like a benefit of being on a campus, being around professors at all times, having to like go to their office hours and also potentially being able to work on research projects with them. So that's something that I don't know, but I don't think you normally get in an online program. Um, also, I don't necessarily, I'm just going to say, and this is again, Blake's opinion, but I don't know that building a good portfolio is more important than education. Thank I you. think sometimes it comes down to, a couple things, uh, who, you know, what you did in grad school that you can talk about. Um, and then also spending what you've done in the past to be, you know, show that you have skill sets that really do focus in on what you want a job in. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that, it, that are at play there. And I, I'll speak from personal experience. Like I would not have the jobs that I've had without my education because people are looking for human factors, people, but also too, I wouldn't be able to do them as well because my methodology experience and lessons that I learned uh, while being in grad school, have been, you know, invaluable to me still today. Uh, so that's all I got, but I hope it's helpful. Yeah. I would add to that in a couple ways. So yes, absolutely. Education is more important than a portfolio. A portfolio will only do so much it, it, you know, uh, if you can't talk about the topic in such a way that conveys that you know the topic, then you're going to have a bad time. Um, I would say that it sounds like it sounds like this person who's writing into the user experience subreddit is unaware of the human factors field, and it sounds like it hits a lot of the same beats. Right? They he, he they sorry they bring up the point of. Uh, a lot of pro programs are focused on design, computer science, or engineering, where human factors kind of takes all three of those, mashes it together, and says, how can we focus on the human that interacts with all three of these things? Um, and so human factors is your answer, I think, to that question. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Also, to, to uh, sort of tackle your concerns with uh, getting the deep understanding, like Blake said, I would echo his sentiment Try to do this in person if uh, if at all possible. If it's within your power, do it because you're going to learn the most from interacting with people who have done this uh, years, who have years and years of experience. Um, you know, there are some online options. Blake mentioned Kent. The, in the actual Reddit post here, just for our listeners' sake, I will go ahead and read off a couple of these other ones. University of Michigan has research-focused HCI program. Um, uh, they're... they're also suggesting programs with applied anthropology and soci sociology, uh, you know, uh, fellowship or funded PhDs, 
a couple options, but I would definitely say, you know, look, look stuff up and you're doing the right thing by going out into the community and asking these questions because it's hard to find these resources, right? Without actually looking into who does what, who's researching what, you're not going to really have a good sense of what's out there um, without without doing that research step. So good on you for getting out there into the community, asking around, um, but start identifying a couple schools that maybe fit the bill and uh, and go from there. I don't know. That's that's about all I got. It's a great uh, great point, Nick. And I'm glad that there were some resources in there. Hopefully that's helpful. But definitely keep looking. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. We can always, uh, you know, get some feedback. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you want us to cover, you can you can do what Dan did. You can follow us on social media. Join the discussion in our Slack. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at 8 Factors Podcast. Uh, check out our SoundCloud. Leave us a comment over there or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you want to do things the old-fashioned way, you can do that too. Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We've got some good rewards over there for those who donate and subscribe. Be sure to like subscribe and review us on apple Podcasts, the google play store or wherever your favorite podcast directory is and of course you can always reach us at our home on the web humanfactorscast.com i want to thank mr blake arnstorff for hanging out with me today and talking about all things human factors where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about artificial intelligence and healthcare okay <laughs> well i've had a few people reach out to me on instagram so i'll plug that one so you can get me on instagram at don't panic ux and nick thank you as always for having me on the podcast i love doing this every week i do too as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome thanks again guys for tuning into human factors cast truly from the bottom of our hearts we appreciate you listening every week until next time it depends it depends That was a little sappy, but I'll take it.